Echa Yeshva Badad. As we know, we started again the Megillah of Echa. And how do we always start? Every Megillah starts with the Ikar, the Yesod of the whole entire Megillah. Echa Yeshva Badad. It speaks about loneliness. It speaks about the fact that we were so great and suddenly we find ourselves all alone. That's A. You go through all the Psukim and you find a common thing that happens all the time. You go to Pasuk Bet. The problem is that there's no Menachem, there's no one around to give us Nechama, to take care of us. Kol Ra'ea, all our friends, Bagduba, all our friends suddenly are rebelling against us. Hayula le Oivim, the people we thought we were closest to, the countries that we thought we could rely on. Hayula le Oivim, they all went against us. And then we move on to another Pasuk. Zachar Yushalai Yemei Aniya Murdea. We remember the great days of Yushalai, and what happens? They're laughing at us, no one's helping us, everyone's against us. This is the theme of the Megillah. Always, uh, Yermiyahu could have started it with anything, and he started with Yishra Yishra Badad. The fact that we're all alone. We continue in another Pasuk. We went to the sink, we went to the bottom. Again, it speaks about the fact that there's no Menachem. There's no one there to be behind us. Now, if you think about it, we're talking about a Megillah that was written about <coughs> the Beit HaMikdash. Does anyone know what happened by the Khorban Beit HaMikdash? Do we have any idea what happened? If you open the Gemaras in Gittin, we're talking about one of the most biggest cataclysmic occur occur occurrences that happened in the history of the Jewish nation. If you go according to the literal idea behind the Gemaras over there, it was worse than the Holocaust. There, were, there was rivers and rivers of blood that was spilled at the time of what happened. It was incredibly uh, gruesome. It was specifically, uh, specifically a, a, a point of destruction. We lost the house of our connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We lost all the Tamid HaChachamim. They went out with the Cherish V'Amazger. There was a tremendous amount of damage that happened at that time. If I was writing Megillat Eicha, I could have thought of many, many things, especially the deaths, the Yusot of the Ruchniyut, the whole entire spiritual backing behind Kla Yisrael that went back. So like I said, it was no less than a Shoah, no less than a Holocaust. It was a horrific thing that happened. And here we are, the focus of the Megillah is Eicha Yeshva Badad, Ein Menachem La, Ein Ozer La. We pass in the Simen Tov Kuf Nun Bet. By the, uh, by the Sudam of Seket, when you're making the Suda, you sit alone. Don't sit with people, there's no Zimun, we don't have any connection with anyone else. The theme of the day is alone, is to be secluded, is to be in solitary confinement, to be independent, to have nothing to do with anything else. That seems to be what the focus of everything is about, and the question is why. What does it have to do? And it's something that bothered me for many years. What is the connection? What's the reason to put such a focus on being alone? It's one thing that it's important, but I'd get a kach to make it the theme. After tough Shin Pei Dalid, which I'm sure many people will be speaking about, but at least this point, I'm not sure if everyone's going to focus on it as much. tough Shin Pei Dalid, I think we all understand Pshat in these Psukim that we just read. After the year we just went through, we've gotten a very clear picture of everything that these Psukim, what Yirmiya exactly meant when he, was, when he was speaking. We've been surrounded for the past 80 years in a country where we've known... We have our cousins, the Ishmaelim, the Arabs, who have been against us, three billion of them that are surrounding the world, and they want us blood. They want us, they want us dead. They don't want us laharag, laashmid, ulaabed. They want us destroyed. They want us annihilated. We're familiar with it. It's very, we're, very, we're very familiar with the impetus that lies behind them. Their whole drive, their whole desire, their whole interest. What compels them to live is only to destroy another Jew. They're bloodthirsty for us, they want us, and it's been like that for many years, for many decades, we're very familiar with it. It's been for centuries, the Rambam already writes about it, but not as bad as it's been now. But it's something we're kind of uh, familiar with it. Mil billions, not millions, billions and billions of dollars have gone into just trying to destroy us. How, much billion, how many billions of dollars have they've invested into one plan just to be able to get us out of here, and to get us out of here good, under, under the water, to get rid of us. Billions and billions of dollars have been invested in defense and trying to protect ourselves from them. This is incredible, crazy amounts of money, tens of billions of dollars, numbers that we can't even fathom, just in order to destroy and defend the Jewish people. That's what it's been all about, this cute little country that's a, a, few, a few miles long, to go from one stretch to the other, you can walk it in a few days. And here it is, all of that has to do with just one interest, one peaking interest to get rid of us. 
But you know what? It's been a long time. We've been here 80 years. We're used to it. We've been around. It's already become a fact of life. It's something that's been accepted. Mr. Dreamim says, they say in Hebrew, it's something that we've already been willing to accept and it's not something that we, that's, a, that's so bad. It's bad, but it's not something that drives us crazy. What we've been introduced to in this year, something we've known but never seen it to such an extreme. And if I could say specifically, people who are non-religious that speak about it to me, when, I, when they speak about it, they're, they're in shock. They're mamish in shock. The fact that, okay, the people on the right are against us, but also the people on the left, also the people on the other side of the ocean, all the Europeans, all America, our big brother, the one who's supposed to be the one who's taking care of us. There's a big bully in the class, he's, bully, bully, he's, he's pushing us around, he's, he's lying about us, he's doing everything wrong about us, at least, can he protect us, can he be behind us? No, no, everybody has found a different way to turn. It's incredible, it's this incredible thing, and I know maybe some of us have thought about it, if not, then it's the time to think about it, this is the day at all. Ten months ago, we were mutilated, mutilated. We were decimated. We were completely in the most indescribable of horities that mankind has Kimat ever seen. Of course, obviously, since the Holocaust. And even before that, uh, just the Holocaust was a break. Before that, you still hasn't been for that, much of a, for, that much, for that much time. And when that happened, there's one thing that we expected, and maybe it was quiet for two or three days, maybe a week. But suddenly we find that what we call the near duff became the rodef. The one who's the chase, the one being chased ended up being the chaser. The one that's playing the defense is suddenly becoming the offensive person. Suddenly there are protests, there are people dressing up in Hamas outfits. It was something that, like I said, I think somewhat of us amongst the religious can somewhat understand it. People who have been so far off were in shock, they were floored, Mamash decimated them. I know people that lost, uh, what they say, tifku, they weren't able to... To, to work for a good number of weeks because of the, 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 the uh, incredible like, uh, surprise of what goes behind them. To have people that are screaming, protesting, everything against us. From the river to the sea, be'emet. Have we ever heard such an expression? You realize the extreme extremity of the, of, the, of, the, of the expression? I know it's an expression, but to hear it and really think, wow, they really, really hate us. They, not only do they hate us, they really want us all dead. It's an incredible thing when that happens. To be able to see this, we have obviously the biggest Rishayim who run, uh, who, run the, who run the world over here, the UN, and their Bahag, who made an official Psak, they made a Psak Beidin from the Psak. There is a unilateral truce that we have to stop, give up on all your uh, captured, on your captured people. It's not going to happen, just give it up and quit committing genocide, quit killing a nation after what they did to us and how many people that we've already lost we're the ones who are, con con who are considered the genocide who are the ones who are killing unconditionally we have to stop and here we have it we read about many countries uh, England is already considering stopping giving arms we know that uh, America is also on there and I'm not here to give politics because probably you guys know news even better than me but the Yisod is one that we end up seeing that you know what we're starting to realize it looks like we really really Eicha yeshva badad. We're all alone. There is no one on our side. There is no one behind us. It's unbelievable to think how we're in such a place of survival. We have six fronts that are on the verge that want to just absolutely destroy us. If a Kaddish Baruch Hu is not protecting us right now, we're, uh, if I could say, Eicha shamli protect people, Satan, we're finished. How can you keep up with countries that have as much money as, as, as they have, Iran, Iraq, Syria, you're talking about places that have crazy amounts of money, and Lebanon, and they have an endless amount of arms to be able to do everything, and we have our hands tied behind our bus because nobody lets us do anything. We're not even allowed to do it. We have no one behind us, and all these fronts, and still, not one person, have you heard that we're in two weeks on probation here? Nobody, everyone's scared to walk where you have to stay next to a mamadum. Have you heard one country say, hey, Iran, stop, give it up, it's not nice, it's not, come on. There's all the there. you're putting them in fear. You have kids who are, who are scared. Have you ever heard one, and one person, there's not one country who said a word. It's very humorous almost. And they're sitting here saying, we're going to rampage them, we're going to get rid of them, we're going to kill them. Everything they're going to say, and not one person gives them a half a word of tochacha. It's an incredible, it's an incredible thing. But it's there to remind us of this phenomenon. And this phenomenon is a scary one. But you know what? And this is the point that I really wanted to uh, bring out. And this is the most important point that I think we see from here. <clears throat> that when we are chased physically, when a person is, uh, or a country, is chased physically, 
wants to, people are interested in killing you, getting rid of you, trying to make sure that you're finished. So you put up a defense system. It's annoying, it's frustrating, it's uncomfortable, it's something that you don't want, it's evil. These people are evil, they're bad. And they're focused on, on weapons. But we also have weapons. And you know what? When people are chasing after you, you could try your best to do to protect yourself and to do what you can, try to raise as much money, try to see as much as you can, even though nobody really wants to give us any. It's only, as I say, bidi evit if you can. But when you come to a war that's emotional, when you come to a war about being alone, it's emotionally taxing. It's incredibly, there's nothing to do. You just push it on your own. It's depressing. It's nothing more than depressing. It's almost you're in a place where, wow, this is just, what do I do now? Where do I go? Where do I turn right and left? You would expect a little bit from all that we are doing to get a little bit of a pat on the back and say, Kola Kavod, you guys are really putting up a good fight. You guys are really putting up a protection fence. You're dealing with one of the craziest people that ever walked on the planet Earth in history, if I call them people. And here you are trying to put up a good fight and doing the best that you can to be able to hurt for survival. You would expect someone to give a little bit of a boost, but no. Sheket, hashket vavetach, chasal. There's nothing, there's no one who wants to say a word. There's no one who's interested. And I compare this to an interesting a mushal, if I can uh, compare it to a, a mushal, which I can say, is let's say you have a person, a husband, who's going through a difficult time. Could be any type of one of a nisayon. No, let's go with a nisayon, of a nowadays nisayon, that let's say he's falling himself into the internet to the wrong places or things like that. He's having a tremendous amount of difficulty, but he's a good guy, he tries his best. He's already putting on himself knasot, he puts on himself fines, he goes to therapies, he speaks to the Rabbanim, and he has failures and he has successes. He has his ups and he has his downs. He's trying his best to do and he fights tooth and nail every day to try to be able to conquer this yetzer, this thing that's getting him, in a, that's getting him and, he can't seem to, and he can't seem to conquer it, vanquish, but he succeeds sometimes and he fails also sometimes. How does this guy keep going? What keeps him going? What keeps him boosting? What fuels him? to be able to continue? What gives him the energy to be able to continue, to be able to push himself, to be able to keep fighting? You know how he's able to keep fighting? If his wife is behind him and says, I see how much you're trying, I'm behind you, I love you, I care about you, I know that it's not easy, and I'm here, I'm here for you as much as you can, let's try this so let's try this, and he, he accepts and he acknowledges, and he co co he's very cohesive to everything that his wife says. So they're working as a team, and as a team they're able to work together, and that'll get himself out of the rubbish. He'll be able to get himself out of the mess. Any type of issue, if he has an anger issue, etc., if he's willing to listen, and she's willing to be there behind him, then you have an onben pellet, as opposed to a karach. You have the, uh, you have the, you have the wife who's able to push him back. But what happens if the wife takes a different turn? You're ridiculous, I don't know why I married you, it's such a mistake, I, I didn't realize you're just a liar, I can't, I can't believe what kind, of, what, kind of, what kind of human being you are, you're just a fake, you're a phony, and that's what he has to hear every time that he wakes up. So what happens to such a person? He's never going to make it. He's never going to succeed. He needs to have someone behind him to give him that boost, to give him a little bit of backing, to believe in him, to give him a little bit of comfort. Much more than physical comfort, which we're always looking for physical comfort, here we are, sitting on the floor, but more than physical comfort, everybody needs, like oxygen, you need emotional comfort. You need a little bit of emotional breath. You need someone to be backing behind you. You need someone to believe in you. People who are on their own, the, the hardest thing about being a homeless person is that you have no one in your life. There's just no one around. It's much harder than not owning anything. It's just a very depressing and uh, indifferent type of way of, of living. It's a very difficult way of living. A person can't continue like that. And it's exactly what we are living through right now. If until now, for the past 80 or however extra amount of years, we thought that we were somewhat okay, we always had some plush place to back up on, at least we have some emotional support from somewhere else, we were able to hold on for dear life. We were able to live and live an existential life over here in this, in this, in this country. We are able to do our best to be able to survive. We are always hoping and backing up for that. Keep it up. We know you can do it. We are behind you. Try to get a kol kavod. And there, there, if we have that, then we could survive. We'll be able to be behind there. But you know what? It, we've realized now it doesn't exist. It's not going to be there. It's not around. And it's all <coughs> very, very painful. It's very discouraging. It very much hurts. And like I said, when I speak to other, it's incredible when you speak to people who are, let's say, not religious, who are sm strong leftists, or people who are, you know, have no lack of, no connection to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, how depressed they are from this whole situation. How, wow, I feel like I'm living through the Holocaust over here. I almost feel like we're living in a situation 
which is on our own, bodeh, and solitary. We have nothing else. It's completely, it's completely un misunderstood and it's completely depressing. That's exactly what we are experiencing right now. It reminds me of a story, if I could say, from one of the families in Barry. One of the families in Barry, there was a family that had two kids, a seven-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl. The two of them saw their father and their mother, mother shot in front of their face, and shot in front of their face. Now apparently these Arabs did not see these two children who were peeking through the door at the time when they saw this occur. And they went and they hid inside of a closet for close to 10 hours they were there till they were retrieved, till they were released from the from there by the, uh, by the soldiers. They were there for a tremendous amount of time, a five-year-old girl and a seven-year-old boy, sitting there quietly, listening to bullets flying everywhere, screams happening from left and right, soldiers and people dying, and just being sitting there quietly on their own. How did they survive? They were badad, eicha yishva badad. How were they able to survive? Ein menachem la. They had each other. At least they had each other. They had one another to give each other a little bit of a boost. Seven and five year old, but in some situations, you become an adult. You suddenly are able to have at least someone by your side to be able to give you a little bit of po a boost. And that's what a person needs. In a case of a situation, like the one we're in, it's very hard to survive when you're completely on your own. When things are there, oh, biyachad ninetzeach. So that's how we started this fight, biyachad ninetzeach. We were all for one and one for all. We all pulled in it together, it was there. And here we are, it's splitting apart. And slowly but surely, the seams are letting loose. And therefore, we're really feel, feeling now the pain of the milchama. It's feeling much stronger right now. So what's the lesson and what can we do with this? And this is, what, uh, this is an important idea, which I, I feel, that, uh, it's, it's my own concept, but I think it's a very important idea, which we have to take from this situation, from the place that we are in right now, this is what we have to learn from this, from this situation. Is being alone good? Is it beneficial or is it detrimental? It, could, it seems to be very negative. It seems to be something not good. I just want to take a quick overview of three or four of our greatest tzaddikim and just see what they did in a case of loneliness. Not necessarily chronological, by the way. Okay? I'll start with David Melech, the great David Melech. I'm a big fan of David Melech, the man who was born into one of the most aristocratic families of the time. Yishai was a flawless person. He never had a sin. That was the father of David Melech, and he had many children who were incredible Talmidei Chachamim, very Chashuvim. And here he is, David Melech comes in, the redhead, and was born, and he was thought to be a mamzer. For whatever reason the story goes, they understood that he was an illegitimate child. He was an illegitimate child. So what did they do? They threw him out into the boondocks. They can't kill him. So what did they do? They threw him out into the woods. They put him as a shepherd into a place where hopefully a lion will take care of him, will devour him. At least we won't have to deal with him. He was always shunned from the family. He was never permitted to be nearby. And for 26 years, think about how long 26 years is. It's a long time. It's a number in a shear, but it's a long time. Think of how, where you were holding 26 years ago. 26 years, he was all by himself, growing up as a child to an adult with a bunch of sheep. That's what he did. And you know what he did during that time period? He composed Tehillim. He composed Tehillim. He became the basis of all our Sidurim. All our Tfilot come from the great and one and only David Amelech. He's the one who was able to be one of the biggest procreators of song, of connection, of affiliation to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. He was the fourth leg in the Kisei HaKavad. I always figured Moshe Rabbeinu always made sense to be number four. You have the three of us, and who's the number four? Obviously Moshe Rabbeinu. And here it is, David Amelech filled the spot. He was the fourth leg in, in the Kisei HaKavad. How could it be that David Amelech got it? He took a situation and he transformed a situation which any one of us would have to go to trauma therapy for years to be able to get out of that type of situation. And he made the most of it to build his relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. He built his connection with Hashem. He was never alone. He was 26 years secluded with his Creator, with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. He built a deep and intimate connection with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. We can't create Tehillim. We can only copy and paste from Tehillim and put it in our Sidur. That's what we do. And that connection came only because of this seclusion, because of the power of this, of this uh, yichud that he had with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Another person, Yosef at Sadiq, it says, 
the Midrash says like this, it says, When Yosef saw the brothers, it says, He gave his voice and cry when he bumped into, when he saw his, pair, his brothers, obviously. So the Midrash says, So too, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give redemption to Bnei Yisrael, That's what the Midrash says, over there in Parshat Bayigash. At the time, when he saw them, he cried, and so too we will have a geula, or the galut will be bebechi, that will have crying. And the Mepharshim asked, the Svarim asked, what exactly is the connection? So I saw Rav Gold, who one time said a beautiful pshat. He said, Yosef at Tzadik for 22 years, what? He was all by himself. He was on his own, no brothers. No father, he had nothing to do. He was on his own. He was in a Goisha country, on his own, with nowhere to turn right and left. He was completely sold up the river. And uh, the whole time he was living, as we say, with Bechi. Until he finally saw his brothers, a reunion that is unprecedented. Something that we can't even kind of connect to. And therefore, the Pasuk, as we know, says, Lo yochal, lo yochal Yosef li He couldn't stop from the Bechi. The Bechi came from a loneliness, an individuality, a place of being on his own, but he created a Yosef that went and eventually cried when he saw his brothers. So too the Galut will be a Galut of the Bechi of Yosef. It will be a Galut where we will realize, and this is the Iker and Ikvet to the Meshicha, when we realize how alone we really are. Eicha yeshva badad. As long as we realize how badad we are, that ein menachem la, vein oizer la, and you have to be on your own, and we're secluded and solitary, the more we realize how individualized we are, how much there's no one else around us, the more we're spending time with our Creator. The more you can turn into a Yosef Atzadik. Yosef Atzadik turned into a metamorphosis, the man of Vayimaen. David turned into a David Amelech. Yosef turned into a Yosef Atzadik. Who's number three on the list of Ram? Again, not chronological. Avram also was a person who we can't even imagine that type of bdidut, that type of separation, the whole world against you. You know, some people are religious, some people are not religious, some people are this type or that type, everybody, but at least you're part of a group. He had no groups, he had him and his wife, him and sorry, Zeo, yeah, nobody else. And he went ahead and started a certain movement which was completely out of whack. It was completely against everything that the whole world stood for. And he was willing to do it and take another, and take another, and take another direction. That's why he was called Evid Ha'ivri. Ha'ivri Yar, he went ahead and, do, and did everything the opposite. 180 degrees from the whole entire world. Where did that koach come from? That came from his 37 years from 3 to 40, on his own, figuring out who's going to be a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And he took that individuality, that secludedness, beyichud with a Kaddish Baruch Hu. From there was created a person who was Avram to Avram Avinu. Everybody created, got a metamorphosis, a new name. A person was created, it was a complete graduation. Because of a situation of being on his own, instead of bickering, complaining, and de being depressed, and being, you take the seclusion, you take that individuality, you take the yichud, the bonim al the osim and you go ahead and you build on it. Being able to go ahead and build myself, build my relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. I'm in a different world, I've graduated to another level. If I can give one more example, <coughs> which I think is a, another great example of a similar, of a similar idea is the great Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we all know, canonized the man of the Zohar. He was the man who is always known when we speak about Kabbalistic writings, the idea of Torah Tassot. Of course, we have the Torah that came from Moshe Rabbeinu, and the Torah Shabal Peh, Torah Shabal Rabbi Kiva, and this. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was known as the man of Mesorat Kabbalah. The man who canonized the old Sefer of Zohar, who put Kabbalah on paper for us, and was able to keep the Hemshech of all Torah Tassod that we got from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. An incredible man who was able to reach incredible heights. Now let's just get straight here. Rabbi Shimon was surrounded by incredible greats all the time. Rabbi Yossi was, we paskin like Rabbi Yossi over Rabbi Shimon all the time. Rabbi Yehud also gets paskin. He, the halakha is like Rabbi Yossi, and then Rabbi Yehud, and then Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon's kebi yocho underneath him in, in Psak. Rabbi Leazar is known as Rabbi Leazar Agadol. He is known as one of the biggest Tanaim that, uh, that existed. Rabbi Kiva, I don't have to describe to you about who, who he was. He, he was dealing with Rameer, Rameer Balanes. As we know, Rameer was able to do incredible Nisim. Rabbi Shimon was surrounded by incredible people. What made Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Meron? How many people go to any kever the whole entire year, but one kever everybody goes to once a year? 
Rabbi Shem Yochai, he's the man who received all this kavod, all this uh, stature. He's known as one of the biggest uh, tzaddikim that we're familiar with. And uh, as we all know, uh, you know, if you have an, at least a one picture of any uh, tzaddik from 2,000 years ago, it's always a picture of Rabbi Shimon. Now, do you look like? I have no idea. But anyways, they always have that. Rabbi Shimon was given this incredible position of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Where did it come from, the Torah to Yisod? So I don't have to tell you. It's obvious. Everybody knows the story in Shabbat. Everybody knows the Gemara and Lamed Gimel over there. That over there he hid in a cave. He was, he was wanted dead or alive. He was chased for no, 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 nothing that he did wrong, Be'etzim. But there was a non-collateral punishment to chase after him. And they wanted him to be, they wanted to chase after him and get him the best that they could. And he had to run away and not even tell his wife. He had to not even tell any relatives of his. And he had to hide in a cave for over a decade, as we all know, 12, 13 years. He had to be there with his Wonderful son, as we all know, Rabbi Shimon son of Lazar. He was there for a tremendous amount of time. He was there secluded. Now just remember, it's not just that he was there secluded in a cave on his own, but what happened? There was no food. A Kodesh Baruch Hu does a nest and he grows a carob tree. You always wonder when you see this, you know, if you're already growing a tree, why carobs? Get apricots, pe peaches, like, you know, give a little bit of flavor. Carobs for 12, have you ever had a carob before? It's a lobby juke geschmack. It's not exactly the best thing I would want to eat in 12 years. I think I'd be, after a while, just, you know, rather not eat for a certain amount. Of, how was he able to, that, that's A. B, we know the Gemara tells us that he didn't want his clothes to wither, so he was buried in the ground for all those years, for that whole entire time, he was buried in the ground. And as a result of that later, when he came back from the cave, when he came back from the cave, he was full of bruises and cuts and, and, and on his whole entire body. And he was in incredible pain even by taking a, when, he took a, when he took a bath, when he had to take a shower. Ad kach that his father-in-law, Repinchas ben Yar, said, Oili sheriticha bekach. His father said, oh, I can't see you anymore. You're in so much pain. Your screams are so loud. I can't see you with all these cuts. Why? A man who had Gilo Eliyahu, a man who was living in Nisim, the man was living in a, in, a, in a cave for such a long period of time, and he had to go through this? What was the reason that he had to go through this? So you know what? The Gemara already answers that question. It says over there, Reb Pinchas ben Yar, when Reb Shimon, his son-in-law, would ask him a question, he would always answer 12 answers. He would always know how to answer 12 answers. But it says, after Reb Shimon Bar Yochai came out of the cave, when Reb Pinchas ben Yar asked a question, he would, uh, Reb Shimon would give him 24 answers. He would give him 24 answers. He was able, there was a metamorphosis that happened in this cave. This, solid, this, this place of solitude ended up changing him to a different darga. And Reb Shimon Bar Yochai says it himself. When his father-in-law says to him, Oili shariyaticha bekach, <coughs> Reb Shimon Bar Yochai responds, you know what he responds to his father? Ashrecha shariyaticha bekach. It's good I'm in pain, I love it. I'm eating it up. It's good. Ashrecha shariyaticha bekach. She'ilmale lo raita bekach, because if you didn't see me like this, lo bikach, then I wouldn't be Reb Shimon Bar Yochai. I would not be on the darga that I am. I would have never been able to reach these levels. The greatest of men, Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai. And still he would not have been able to reach if he didn't have that koach of solitude, of being on his own. A little bit of being no outside interference. Making and my own idbodidut, my own place, and to go ahead and make a change. He built his relationship with his creator. He made himself a different person and that's why he was able to be the greatest of, 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 of one of the greatest of all the Tanaim, to be able to do that. And of course, we know, lastly, last example, this is the most straightforward, is Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu had to go 40 days where? With no one else. There was a gvul on the, har, on the har, and nobody else was allowed to progress onto the mountain. Because the only way the Kabbalah the Torah could happen, we were changed into a nation. B'nai Yisrael. Ha'am anifchar. We were changed into a nation. How? With Moshe Rabbeinu's Oneness with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, his, 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 his Yichud Hashem, that he had only him, between him and his Creator. From here we see a tremendous and important Yesod, and we're living through it right now. That's why it didn't need to be spoken about until this year. That the idea of taking individuality, of being on your own, being in complete solitude, being without anyone to your left and to your right, it could be depressing but it could be one of the greatest gifts that all of us have. It's something that we're able to do and take it and put ourselves on a different level. We can move our nation to a different level because when you go and you make that connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, it's on a different, it's on a different wavelength. 
We always cry about the Beit HaMikdash and nobody can relate to it and I understand because we never saw it and we never were there and we could try to explain and experience what happened with the Kohanim and Levim. But the real way of understanding it is the Beit HaMikdash was not just a shul, it was a house. It was a house where we lived with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. On the front door said our names, Kev We ate dinner with the Kaddish Baruch Hu at a shulchan with, 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 with some bread. And we had meat. We had, a, we had a candelabra that was lighting, that was lighting, and we had a candlelit dinner together with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. There were flowers on the table, the turret that had a tremendous sale. There was singing around us from the Levim. There was an experience here of us, Imashchina, of our connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's not just an idea of bringing it back. You know what it says when we did the Gimel Regalim? When it speaks about the idea of the Gimel Regalim, it says this in the Pasuk, Shalosh Pamim B'Shana, Yer'eh Kol Shurechet Pnei Hashem. Three times a year, we have to go to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And the Gemara Darshan's Yer'eh, to see, Yer'eh, to be seen. Both. You need to see and to be seen. It's a date. We're going out on a Kebi Yochul, Kebi Yochul, a Shidduch with a Kodesh Baruch Hu. It's a time of Yichud with a Kodesh Baruch Hu. The Beit HaMikdash was the place that we were in the Shidduch room. That we are in the Yichud room, excuse me. We are in the Yichud room where we had the individuality between us and Hashem and nobody around. In the Yichud room, even if someone's in the corner doing sponja, that messes up the whole thing. It could be that he's minding his own business, but it don't work. The only way to have a proper Yichud room, to make a Kenyan with the Chassan and Kala, with the Chatan and Kala, is one way. Nobody is around. You are absolutely alone. The room is closed, it's locked, and it's just me and the other person. That's it. That's what Yichud is about. And that's where we're holding right now. We're living in a matzav of Yichud with the Kaddish Baruch Because there's no one else to rely on. And we're, in the, you know, we could throw out metaphors in between like this, but to finally realize that we really are just us and Him. To be feeling so comfortable in the hands of our Creator. Because we know we are 100% in His hands. It's just us and Him. Hashem Kebi Yochel divorced us for 2,000 years. He threw us out of His house. He threw the house out. He burned the whole place down. He threw us out of His house. We're not there. A musk, a funny musk is sitting there with a bunch of idiots who are there, they're bowing down and pretending that they have some religious that was created a thousand years ago. I'll be careful what I say on the camera. Okay? But that's, 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 that's where it's holding. And when we are finally getting ourselves back into the Yichud room that seems to be heralding in that it could be the house is being rebuilt. The house, the Beit HaMikdash, which we meant to always have, is there to rendezvous, to come back to that old meaning place, to come there. When you go to the Kotel, you're not going to a wall. You're going back to your old house. When I go to Los Angeles, I grew up in a house for 17 years, which uh, we're not there. My parents don't live there anymore. But I always try to take a sneak peek and pass by there. Why? Because I just have a certain, like, uh, Kesher to that place. I grew up there when I was little. The place looked so big and now it looks so small. But anyway, yeah, you were there and you had a certain Kesher to the, to, to the place. And you want to just be there. When you go to the Kotel, that's the feeling. When you go to the Kotel, you put your hand on the wall and think what's on the other side of the wall. That's where home was. That's where we used to have a certain relationship with a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Chasal, chasal, chasal. And it's all gone. It's all not there, but that's exactly what we're beckoning for. We're looking to return to that place, and this can happen with a metamorphosis. Like we said, the Yichud is what re-changes anybody. Our greatest people were made the greats only because of that. So you should realize that when a person goes into his own place, he's not running away from something, and when he feels the pain, he's craving for something that he misses. When he goes in, into his own place, it's not running away from the metziyut, running away from the, from, from the existence, from the reality, it's running to the reality. Because when you're on your own, sometimes you're in touch with yourself. You're in touch with your creator. You're in touch with your relationship. That yichud is able to make an absolute change. It's able to turn things topsy-turvy. It's able to make a person into a great person and a nation into an unbelievable into an unbelievable nation. And that's the power that we've been created. And Baruch Hashem, we are living through that. And I say, Baruch Hashem, yes, we're living through a situation where it's so good that, yes, everybody can't stand us. Everybody's writing off against us. Yes, every time we do something, they're upset at us. It's time for us to realize, it's okay, we don't need you anyways. It's time for us to realize that it's just us and Him. As the Gemara in Chagiga says, and with this I'm going to finish, based 
Basically, it says in the Gemara Chagiga, "Atem asitim oti chativa achad be'olami." You made me one in this world with the Shema Yisrael. Afani ese etchem chativa achad. So too, I am going to make you a oneness in this world. I'm going to make you individualized. No going around, nothing around. It's only going to be between me and you. No more limbo. Maybe a little bit this. Maybe a little bit of that. There's no more of that. It's only going to be between. Between us and him. And with this we end, and uh, we'll maybe sing a thing, but I just want to say, we say on Shabbat, when we sing, and there's a, a, a nigun which you might not be familiar with, but when we speak about going back to the Beit HaMikdash, uh, we, speak, we say, Le Mikdash Echtu V'le Kodesh Kodeshim. Le Mikdash Echtu V'le Kodesh Kodeshim. Going back to the Kodesh Kodeshim. We yearn and we want to come back to the Kodesh Kodeshim. We're begging to go back to the, base of, to the Beit HaMikdash. Atar Hatar Divei. The place, the place that what? With there's Kohanim, Levi'im. That, that's what you would think. What does it say? Atar hatar divei yichdun ruchin ve'nafshin ruchin ve'nafshin The simcha of the ruach and the neshama The simcha of the neshama being able to finally feel complete Finally be satisfied with our relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu Ve'yizamu lach shirin v'rach Hashem And over there is the place that we're going to be able to uh, sing together with the Kodesh Baruch Hu So a lot more than just singing about the Beit HaMikdash Or focusing and not just about the Kohanim and the Korbanot but it goes a step beyond that, and that is the idea of Izam Rulach, of the connection, Ruchim Benafshin, the satisfaction that we have between, between the two. Fail of the 